it's uh, it really does feel like a TV show where we have the countdown uh, for for this uh, session, which is probably the most celebratory session of uh, today, and and also even the the whole Amsterdam community meeting. Um, as you see from the slide, my name is Silla Sepp. I'm the programs lead at MyData Global, and I have the pleasure to to host the whole session today and congratulate. Um, the awardees of MyData Operator 2021 uh, today. In this 90-minute session, actually, that we have today, um, we don't only announce uh, the, the awardees, uh, but uh, we will also have the chance to, to hear from the city of Amsterdam uh, what are their thoughts about um, development uh, in, in the city and what, uh, what kind of city they would like to, to be. Um, we will also get to know operator services much better. We have three different operator services from three different continents joining us uh, uh, today. Um, and also hear further insights about what, what kind of, uh, what have we learned in the recent months and, and year um, for, from engaging and, uh, and working together with, uh, with operator services. But, um, but before we go into all of these different uh, sections, I think it's also important um, and would serve us uh, as a wider community uh, to, uh, to take a step back and just make sure that uh, everybody is on the same page uh, and uh, understand what we mean by my data operators. Um, when we talk about my data operators and, and also how do they foster the human centric approach to personal data. So um, really starting from the MyData concept, hopefully everyone joining in today here um, uh, on site or uh, online know already the general MyData concept and the basic idea of individuals having more control over their data and really also having meaningful ways how to benefit uh, from, from their data. Having control uh, can manifest itself in, in many different ways, but essentially that means that uh, um, us as people have more um, possibilities to access data about uh, ourselves, use it, reshare it to other stakeholders, correct it if need be, and, and really uh, just benefit uh, from, from that um, to, to live better lives. And, uh, in this way, when we start to make uh, this human-centric approach to personal data happen, we start to move towards a more fair, more sustainable and more prosper prosperous digital society. In this context, people get value uh, from their data and set the agenda on how it is used. And at the same time, for organizations, using data ethically is the most attractive option on the, on the market. So it's already given um, to, to use it in, in that manner. But in order to get to that, uh, we need to also take collectively some few but uh, really important steps. A uh, few of them are, have been also mentioned throughout the Amsterdam community meeting uh, already. And really, um, the starting point is um, to providing more actionable means how to get access to data, how to use it, uh, how to share it further and, and benefit from, from that. Um, to start providing uh, individuals uh, really better services that truly benefit uh, and, uh, and empower them uh, to, to use that data even. And finally, building and developing those uh, services in a way that it's for open ecosystems rather than closed ones in order to avoid that um, value creation is really possible only for one or few selected uh, service providers. These are great, very big um, steps to take um, and the question is how? Surely um, there's a need for commonly used standards uh, that really show how things should uh, um, be developed. Um, it's needed that there's good governance um, in order to ensure trust in the service providers as well as the ecosystem in, in general and infrastructure where all of this should happen, the tools, um, the environment where we um, move uh, data around. And here is where my data operators uh, come, to, come to play. Um, operators essentially are those uh, service providers who provide uh, individuals the um, ways how to securely access 
data, integrate it, share it to others, um, and, and so forth. So these uh, operators provide that infrastructure uh, for both organizations, but also individuals uh, to manage data about themselves. And you see already uh, this uh, image that have uh, also been mentioned many times throughout the day, that this is a uh, a network of different types of organizations with different roles of their having um, of data source, data using using service, and operator. So this infrastructure also gives the means uh, to uh, control the flows of data from one entity to another, not only accessing data within uh, within organizations. Um, Operators are nothing new uh, or invented by My Data Global. Uh, they have been emerging from the market for many, many years, as we learned also from Kuhn's presentation earlier today. Um, and these have been mentioned uh, or described with the different um, names in the, in the past, like personal information management systems, data trusts, information banks, uh, and the likes. Um, but what they all essentially are, 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 and what they do is facilitating data flows as a trusted intermediary, and, and that is important to keep it in mind, and that's how we uh, call them uh, my data operators. What we've learned throughout the years, though, is that uh, operators are still also very different. How do they provide their services? Um, but the operator thematic group has defined uh, some core el elements, some core functional elements that all of the operator services deploy and implement and offer um, one way or another. And uh, not all operator services cover all of those functional elements. They might have a selection of those, um, but uh, it's, um, all of them have something included. If you'd like to learn more of what those sole functional elements uh, entail, then I recommend and encourage you to go to the My Data Operators um, website, uh, download the, the white paper there, and, and dive in to some more details about those. What is important to remember, though, is that um, operator services still operate, uh, they, uh, they work in an ecosystem with other organizations. And those organizations need to provide their services in an interoperable way in order to really uh, win uh, from, from those data flows. And that is a huge, huge task. Um, those, this interoperability is already uh, important from this, this uh, third shift that I mentioned, from going from closed to, to open ecosystems. But um, because it's so tricky, My Data Global is also um, engaging um, with service providers to start moving towards it. We call it as a journey towards interoperability. And uh, this is really what actually My Data Operator 2020 Award is all about. Um, engaging with those service providers to really understand how do they do uh, their, uh, provide their services, how do, do they do it in practice, and, um, and at the same time recognizing them celebrating them, that uh, really um, sh showing uh, the great work that they're doing um, in the actual market for, uh, for putting this human-centric approach to personal data, um, making it uh, to, or bringing it to, to life. So this is what, where I end uh, for the starting point. Uh, you will hear, get the chance to, um, to learn more from those uh, three operator services and as well as the operator landscape a little bit more in detail later on during the session. But for now, I will actually welcome on stage Ger Baron from the city of uh, Amsterdam. Um, he's a, um, the chief uh, technology officer in the city, um, been responsible for the innovation of the city, the R&D, different partnerships. And uh, what Ger mentioned uh, in the, when we talked before, before the session, then uh, mentioned that really for the city of Amsterdam, individual data rights, the values are really, really important. And they are asking in the city of really what kind of city do we want to be? And, and I think we have a chance to hear it right away, how it's going to look like in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, well, to say a few words, basically. Um, I always think when it's, um, because I really like your presentation, but the whole idea, but for me as a, 
well, civil service in the city of Amsterdam, actually, it's, I would say, a bit bigger. I mean, uh, uh, data is a thing in a bigger city. Obviously, it's getting more and more important. Um, but this discussion about who owns the data, who manages the data, what's the ecosystem, and, and can a uh, well, uh, user, consumer, but for us, a citizen, uh, can be the owner or, uh, of its own data. And um, uh, so I will start a bit, talk about a bit of narrative we're seeing this in for two minutes, but I think for us it's important that we don't see this as a, well, separate thing or something that's new, but I mean we should destruct a whole system, basically, that we created around industrial revolution about centralizing all types of stuff, etc. So, uh, sh oh, I should stand over here, I've got instructions. And I want to do the dance and everything here. No, um, so a bit of context. Um, so for, for us, I mean, when we talk about data, because this is a data conference, not a data conference, I just understood, so that's some, so something as well. I mean, it's part of a bigger development. Um, for us, when we talk about personal data and individual data and managing data and how to cope with data, it starts actually, I mean, at the idea of the 1600s. I mean, don't Amsterdam started to gather data uh, from individuals, from travel routes, etc., and this made us the richest city in the world at a certain point of time. Um, so collecting data uh, was at the key, basically, in our success in the 1600s. In a square by two by 200 meters, dump square, uh, uh, we gathered all the data of all the routes around the world, gathering data from logs, from individuals, etc. Uh, uh, so in the, on our DNA in trade, etc., is this gathering data, and well, throughout the century, I mean, we developed our city around this, this trade and everything, and so it has a big impact. Your economy, data economy, has a tremendous impact also on the physical city. So for us, it's not only about the digital world, there's a one-to-one -one connection to the physical world, and well, in digital revolution, we started to create stuff like this, but um, starting at the, well, let's say, digital revolution and uh, the internet for the last three, four decades, um, we came from an industrial point of view where everybody gathered data and centralized data and we created big organizations, uh, uh, economically strong, uh, uh, but based on getting all the knowledge in a certain organization. We had IP, uh, we started to uh, uh, collect data on individuals, we started to make data something that was even more important than in the 1600s. So the whole industry around this and that what we saw by the start of the internet and every internet evangelist at the beginning started, well, this is a good thing because now data is democratized, everybody has access, and the whole world will be happy and shiny because now we don't have this big institutions owning, managing data and knowledge anymore. So for me, this discussion about my data is also about how can we get rid of these big institutes that actually have been growing for the last years. I mean, all these big techs all do the same thing as in the Industrial Revolution. They say that they're decentralized. But in the end, they're not, because they're centralizing the knowledge, the data, putting even more IP on it, uh, uh, and gather as much data as possible. And the business model is even data. Uh, and this is different than 200 years ago, because then products were the business model, but now data is the business model in itself. So when we really want to talk about these things seriously, we should also redefine what's our economy, what's the type of city, in our case, you want to be. Do you want to be a city with companies that actually own data, because when you don't get rid of that, all the things we discussed today, and on events like this, which I, I foster and I'm, I'm a big fan, uh, or in the sideline, because we need to break down the other business models as well, otherwise I'm convinced this will be keeping a niche. So we need to work together also on the creative destruction of existing business models, I would say. So this is an introduction. For us, this is important. And for us also, uh, what has changed, and when I talk about this new type of city, said this is an industrial type of city, and when you start to think about what does the new digital economy and the data economy does to us, it's a tremendous opportunity when we do this right, eh? because you could start to change your city, basically. You can put example given in, uh, 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 get rid of the traditional industry. So creative destruction is quite hard, because we managed to get cars in in 10 years, and we got rid of them in 30 or 40 years. Uh, we got shell out in the Netherlands, that's a good thing, probably. Eh? <laughs> um, but um, uh, it took us quite a while as well. So redesigning your city, basically, in a physical sense, I think it's very comparable to the data point of view, basically. Be because when we want to go to uh, shared mobility and more efficient mobility, etc., we need to get rid of traditional models and traditional trade models. But to do this, you need to exchange data with all these new platforms as well. So for the new economy that we see popping up, we ne need to make a few design questions. And uh, these design questions are... I think based on, well, probably five times earlier today, this, uh, this picture, but when you see that this is happening to the internet, this is also happening to every industry, isn't it? So um, energy sector used to be an energy plant, popping down energy to your uh, dishwasher. Nowadays we have distributed energy networks based on data, based on 
uh, the individual who can, well, actually we could start our own energy company today. We could put solar panels on our roof, uh, we could gather a lot of data of ourselves together and we have our own energy company. So this is happening to everything. So also to the governments, I mean, uh, uh, but not a single government has made this step because we still centralized organizations with the mayor controlling the whole stuff and then trickling down. But in the end, this is happening to us. So in the end, when we could start an energy company, hey, why can't we start a government? Well, in essence, uh, the government has the data and controls the data, so it's hard for us to start our own healthcare insurance company. It's hard for you to start your own government because I would say a lot of tasks could be, like energy companies, could be distributed in the network as well. So when we really want to disrupt society, we need to tackle the whole thing. How can we make sure I really control my data and not a bit of it or uh, just for fun things? Or just for so for us, this discussion about uh, make sure citizens own their data, have access to the data, share whatever they want to. It's actually about a bit about creating destruction of economy, and this industry, energy sector, but also about the government because the current government, don't quote me in, uh, in, 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 in <laughs> any magazines on this, but the current government obviously is bankrupt as well in that perspective. So we need to redefine the government as well. So this discussion for me is not about data or data or whatever, but it's about how can we uh, create a new governance, a new government, a new way we organize ourselves in industries and society. So for it's a rather big discussion, I think, for my book. And then we have all, all types of nice projects to demonstrate, but then we think it's a bigger discussion for us as well. Uh, and this whole idea that uh, uh, we change as a government as well, or we can do this. I mean, we have every four years, we have elections, so we want to do this secondly and fast, but the real feedback is every four years in elections and politics. So I would say uh, uh, the gathering of data and use of data has a big impact on everything we do and the whole idea that we bring the control back to citizens, because we rather talk about citizens from a city perspective, but individuals, people, whatever, um, is for us quite important. So this is the city we want to be as Amsterdam is not a city that's facilitating data gathering around the city. It's not facilitating data economy in that perspective. But obviously, we want to facilitate new initiatives that actually disrupt or break down traditional industries. So very practical, I mean, we uh, defined an uh, agenda uh, within the last years. In 2019, we actually we do have a smart city program, but we defined uh, a digital agenda which was based on the idea, what's the city you want to be? You want to be a city where people can move in a digital world, can move around freely, safely, um, inclusive. So uh, how can we avoid discrimination? How can we avoid the people's data being stolen the whole time they work in the public space? And how can we make sure uh, uh, democracy is being taken care of as well? And how do we avoid discrimination? Because obviously the whole idea uh, you see, uh, well, making use of algorithms which are by default uh, uh, discriminating basically, how do you cope with this as well? So for us, it's the main question is what's the type of city you want to be? And part of his answer is not a city that manages all your data and owns all the data, not a city that allows companies to gather data in the public space without you knowing it. So we try to uh, do a whole bunch of uh, projects around this. So um, once upon a time, basically, I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, we registered uh, data from citizens uh, and then we got all this uh, information. We got a passport, which is an interesting concept. I'm no, I always try to explain my kids who are four and six that um, to prove who they are, they need a paper, basically, which is interesting. And so, hey, I mean, no, 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 you're not. And then you need a paper to prove who you are. This is an interesting concept. I mean, uh, uh, that the government decides who you are. We actually sell for 50 euro, 70 euro 50, uh, we sell a document stating that you're still alive. Interesting, huh? um, So you, you need to personally get it, actually. So it's, an, well, nobody really gets these things, I would say. So um, uh, this is what we are registering. But when you want to apply for welfare uh, in our city, you need to uh, fill out 48 fields with all types of data again and again. In the Netherlands, there are 1,300 databases having, before COVID, probably it's no way more, actually, uh, 1,300 databases with name and uh, your, um, um, your government number, your service number are combined together, basically. So we gather all the data in every place, basically. And the only way to get rid of this, basically, is to make sure we get one place, you gather this, it's controlled by yourself. So this is not something extra. This is not place 1301, I would say, but it should be all the 1300 government type of organizations should go to that certain point. Um, and then the internet came in, basically. So we now have digital proof as well. Um, DigiD is the main in the Netherlands, um, uh, uh, where we could digitally say who we are, but still stated with all the information that's collected in the uh, in the register we have um, by a paid names basically. So um, so when you start to think about this, how can we make sure we start to make the relevant data use the relevant data for certain purposes? Once you start to think about this, so this is not even a solution, and we end up 
The next slide will be about IRMA, as most people know, basically as a project. But this whole discussion of how can you make sure you share the relevant information at the proper time is interesting. But if this is still behind, uh, it's quite a bit. So we started to work with the whole idea, uh, well, around EID, basically, uh, and, and the law around digital government. Um, started to work on a program that actually was talking about data minimization. Privacy by design, be transparent, well, all the things you put in your slides as well. Um, uh, so we thought we need to do something around these things. And then the interesting question that popped up, which I think is interesting as well, is um, once you can share a bit of information, uh, such as uh, uh, with uh, uh, the IMR project, does everyone know the IMR project? Most people know? Well, well it's, it's about you just upload basically, uh, upload basically your passport to your uh, uh, smartphone and you share the relevant information from your passport uh, that's necessary at that moment. So when people only need your name, you only sh verify your name. So you don't share your birth date, you don't share your, if you're, uh, your sex or whatever. So it's you only share the relevant information. My big problem with this is maybe um, you're in this as well. Once you start to think about this, it's, been, it's getting easier to share a bit of data. So the effect can be that you only share relevant information in a relevant moment. But the thing we saw is that actually everybody wants a bit of information all the time. And the big risk nowadays, we make it easier to share a bit of information. So showing your passport is quite a big thing, eh? so you don't do that the whole time. Telling who you are is quite easy. But now we are, oh yeah, just share only your name from your passport to verify who you are, or, or your, your age, or your sex, or your uh, 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 place of living, or place of birth, whatever. So the interesting thing is we make it easier to share a bit of data, and now we're asking the whole time to share a bit of data. So the, the transactions in terms of data actually are increasing. So we, we, we thought we do, we're doing something very privacy aware, making it only easier to share a bit of data, which is true, and I'm still a big fan of this thinking. Uh, but the effect is also that people think, oh, well, asking for a passport is a bit, bit of a big step. Let's ask for a bit of data. So just say who you are. And the whole idea of trust that you state, I am who I am, and you just trust somebody who somebody, well, I'm here. Nobody asked me if I'm really here. Uh, I could be a random chubby guy walking around over here if you're talking about it, isn't it? But, um, uh, but I'm not, I'm here. So, so but nobody asked for my passport, and that's, that's a big step. But step away is can you please verify a bit of your data so you, your transactions actually will increase. So we, the whole idea about privacy by design, fan of it, but we really should think about what's the effect. And during Corona, we saw that now it's normal that one citizen asks another citizen, hey, could you please verify that you're uh, had your vaccine. Oh, you're vaccinated. Just a civ one civilian after to another civilian. Well, big step, isn't it? We wouldn't have done that when you get the whole passport included as well, but it's only a bit of data now. Oh, well, let's ask for this little thing. But obviously, I would say this is a slope where you don't want to go on to because a cit one citizen controlling another citizen on these things, basically, next step, what will be the next step? I mean, well, I am chubby, I told it already, but it's, uh, it's, in a, it's, it's relevant when you go to the McDonald's as well. But, we, but to do this, to make this um, uh, for the uh, better, actually, you start to talk to citizens who actually are very interested in uh, uh, thinking about what, what do I want to share, what, what's what I don't want to share, and everybody starts at the beginning, I want to share everything, and then at the beginning you end with only a name, probably. Yeah? This everybody knows these things when you really start to discuss what does it mean when you start to share stuff, and whom. But they all want to be in control, actually, so from kids to uh, elder, elderly people and a lot of pilots about how can we use this idea of sharing a bit of data when you want to vote in your neighborhood um, uh, for, well, th the best uh, playground or whatever. You only need to know somebody lives in this neighborhood, not age, not sex, not address. Uh, when you want to go to a bar, you only want to know somebody's 18, can have alcohol, yes or no, you don't need a name, etc. So we did a whole bunch of this interviews, small experiments, proof of concepts, uh, and actually this worked quite well. Um, and as I said, the only thing is that I'm afraid of that we now start to make it normal to ask for a bit of data from somebody because just a bit of data. Just want to know if you're vaccinated, yes or no. Just want to know if you're 80, yes or no, because I don't believe you. So w I'm just curious, I don't have a clue. I'm, we're going to do research about it, but what does it do with trust? So I talked with uh, uh, Ufa last week basically to start some research about it. What does it do with trust? Because you don't trust anybody anymore, we just always want to check if somebody has a data, et cetera. So it's an interesting question for us, uh, journey as well. Still we need to do this, eh? so, so we ended up with, uh, uh, together with the MRT team basically about uh, creating a new UX, lots of discussions, and we plan to pilot next year quite a bit further, and actually going to use this for, uh, well, our uh, digital democracy, et cetera. So I'm collecting and gathering your own data. We also started the uh, mainamsterdam.nl where we uh, give insight to all Amsterdamers which data we collect for them, and the next step will be for what purpose, because 
most of the time we really don't really know what's the purpose we collect the data, to be frank. So when we asked for 48 fields for people applying for welfare, uh, we just did some data minimization. We actually, we need eight fields. And we asked for 48. So uh, uh, why? It's easy to have. It's easy to have this to do control. That's the last part of the sentence. But we um, um, don't really need to know it because we don't know. We don't need to know your age, actually. We don't need, we need to know, are you between 18 and 67? Uh, 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 do you, what's your, uh, not what is your income, but is it below? Uh, what's your uh, 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 situation in your house? We don't care about other people, are there any people in your house, and do they have an income? I mean, these are the questions, but still we ask who is it? Well, uh, uh, so 48 fields and we only need eight. So this is more or less where we are in practice, but we're now experimenting a, a bit less, basically. So we experimenting for, well, uh, voting stuff, basically. Did you actually go there, or you live in a certain neighborhood? Um, uh, which is new for us, also in defining what's a, what's a citizen. Uh, 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 because the interesting thing about once you collect your data, what, and you manage your own data, what do you need to do to prove that you are a citizen for us, basically? Is it, what's a neighbor? It's an interesting question. Uh, is it when you live there 100 days a year, 200 days a year? Is it uh, when you rent out your house, yes or no? Is it uh, when you just visit the neighborhood every day but you don't live there? I mean, defining a neighbor is a discussion in itself, basically. So for all these things, well, we need to have a few of these cases, basically. And, and, as, and the starting point is, um, once we start to rethink that we, how the data economy is being structured and built, and we see that traditional companies, banks, but also big tech, uh, actually play a role that they have a business model gathering more data and do analytics, and you actually want to get rid of that and make sure we control our own data. We need new business models. Um, but we also need a new well, narrative about rights, basically. So uh, we talk a lot about privacy, et cetera, but the whole discussion about digital rights in this context is even more important for us as well, because as a government, uh, this is what we do. I mean, we do legislation. I mean, we do stuff ourselves. We can give an example, but we also do legislation. So we now try to make uh, legislation for, well, people who uh, have platforms for uh, taxis, uh, make legislation for people who uh, rent out houses via platforms, uh, and the data they get. So on the one hand, we want to have data from vacation rental platforms to make sure people are not, well, renting out their house too much or et cetera. On the other hand, when you then ask the question, oh, would you be confident that when you go to the US that uh, Airbnb gives all your data to the United States government as well? And then we thought, hey, this is not necessary, et cetera. So we really need to think, how can we make sure you control the data on these platforms as well? So maybe they don't even need to get our data. Maybe they just can uh, uh, um, uh, verify it but are not allowed to give it away. So we really need to rethink uh, how we cope with these platforms. So we uh, well started an initiative around Digital Rights House in Amsterdam and, and several other cities being launched in the next three months. Uh, and we started a program around cities for digital rights because we do think that in cities you see happening, what's ha we, what, what are the effects of all this data gathering around you on the national government? Well, you, you see what's happening probably as well. But when it goes wrong, there's always a place where people find out that data is their data's being stolen, uh, um, they're being, well, uh, 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 the, the victim of algorithms that don't really work, uh, or wrong data is being put in place, or you're hacked, or whatever in your data. Uh, uh, the place where you see, it's always a place, always a person in a certain place where it goes wrong. So we really try to uh, also be a help desk for them as well and help them uh, with their data and their data management as well. So from our perspective, I mean, I'm a really, well, for the last four or five years, big fan of the uh, My Data Initiative. Um, uh, and for us now, it's uh, well, basically also the, the, the infrastructure, I would say, for a next step where we need to redefine our economy and also redefine or define what's the city we want to be in the digital world and how can we make sure people can move around freely, how can we make sure people can move around without discrimination, and this means we need to have digital rights in place, also giving the people the right to know who's using the data, for what, uh, and can I actually stop it and have the right to do so. So this is a quick introduction for how we look at my data and data in general in Amsterdam. Thank you. Those were the lines before. Hopefully, this, it's safe here. Uh, thank you, Ger, for, for this really interesting uh, presentation and basically asking those tough questions, uh, challenging uh, the ways how we have potentially even like legacy systems, but also legacy. Uh, concepts um, still deployed in, in the ways how we operate uh, in a city. And what I also picked up in a way was that uh, city as a public administration is asking um, what kind of city do we want to be, but pr 
also the people living in that city create that city. So together, uh, I think it's a really, really valuable question to ask and discuss together what kind of uh, si um, city the people themselves also like to um, would like to uh, create and f um, yeah constantly develop and using potentially even the same uh, data and the s uh, different services yeah, yeah. for, for that. Hand, the, 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 the influence is bigger than ever because access to everything, knowledge about everything is way bigger basically. And, and the other side is issue, algorithms decide how you move through the city mm -hmm. because your navigation system is uh, popping you from A to B. Uh, uh, so, th so the interesting thing is how can you make sure uh, 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 you really take a stance and I think Local governments and, 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 and their citizens actually need to make sure they take a stance and mm -hmm. not, uh, uh, well, let all the other things happen as well. Yep. We do have time for one or two questions or reflections if there's anything to, to share. Um, I see a hand from Will. I don't know if I can move there, <laughs> otherwise. Sure. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, First of all, you made I mentioned passport being a physical evidence, but in fact, it's the only place where you have a digital identity. Exactly. It's only nicely encapsulated in plastic, but it's, it's your digital identity given to you by the government. Uh, the question, uh, talking about those microtransactions, that's a very interesting thing because all those micro trans identity transactions uh, could lead to, to knowing much too much. But isn't it um, essential in self-sovereign identity is that those microtransactions don't add up at by design? So. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what is your, yep. your, your, your um, uh, why are you a bit worried about all those microtransactions if they wouldn't add up or do they add up? Uh, two thoughts, so yeah, you're right about it, but I, I try to put it in history basically, but even still, I mean, the whole fact that I said that I myself, I need, I need proof from a digital thing or a paper thing still feels silly, isn't it? I mean, when I walk through the customs, so, hey, I'm, I mean, it's based on, not on trust, basically. Uh, so the whole system is about, you don't trust yes, people, right. you want to have this. So, um, and I would say that that's in line with, with your second question. I think distrust uh, 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 can be a driver because all the small transactions as well. Um, uh, the whole idea that you, well, it, it, we're not there yet, but I expect that when I will be walking to a venue like this, now that you write down your name, etc., and this for you, you, you chip in with something and it's registered your name and maybe your date of birth and your job, etc., because they need to know it basically. So when you, the whole time when these go on, in the end they, they add up because there will be people combining stuff, how people move through the city as well. So by, by design, you should think about these things because otherwise you have a whole bunch of transactions which, which will add up actually. But also when you, uh, the whole idea that you don't trust people anymore based on who they are, what they say, I think it's, it's, it's for human social networks actually something we need to think about. And I'm, 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 I'm not sure if it's going the wrong way. But, but uh, I, I don't feel very confident that somebody would ask my passport when I would walk in, not trusting me, saying I'm me. So it's a bit of the, the whole thing that we, and, and I'm pretty sure things will start to add up when you will have, well, breadcrumbs throughout the city uh, being you. And then you have a new business model for platforms to uh, uh, come. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Just to check, is there also any reflections or questions from the online participants to give them a chance to also ask? Nope. Okay. Then, so when there are any ideas was there people who think we should play a role into it, please, uh, please reach out to us uh, as well, basically, because I mean, I'm not sure we can do any project, but we can uh, give guidance and see if what we can do together as well. Go ahead, then. Yeah, I was uh, curious. I think you mentioned a couple of times uh, the creative destruction uh, that you are calling. I'm a big for. fan of Schumpeter, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm just curious what uh, what the kind of big tech and let's say the established companies uh, think about. What's what's your recipe for like cities which are pretty much establishments uh, uh, calling for the creative destruction? How do you go about that? Yeah, I mean, a really uh, great question. So it's. Um, I think it's in two things. First, I, I, I thought uh, I considered the, the following as a compliment. Uh, uh, I was uh, reached out to me, I think, six months ago by the European Commission, and they said, "Hey, you know, this whole smart city thing, and we, we don't see Amsterdam anymore. Are you? What's happening? Don't you do anything anymore?" So, who told you? Yeah, IBM and Cisco. So, okay, that's a good thing. Thank you. Um, uh, um, because their business model is based on centralization and, 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 and big data centers and platforms, etc. Uh, secondly, I think what we can do, and what we already try to do, in, in, uh, when we hand out concessions about the city for, well, I named taxi certification, rental platform, but also logistic companies coming up, shared mobility, and all these things, 
uh, uh, just eat, uh, we had a discussion with. I think when we would uh, uh, allow them to do business in a city, we should also give them the rules based on what, and data gathering shouldn't be part of the business model. I mean, this is one of the reasons we uh, got all this uh, shared bikes, uh, this floating bikes out of the city. It took us half a year to get legislation in place, uh, but then we got them out in, uh, in a single month, putting on trailers and trucks and sent them to Africa. Uh, um, uh, getting the technology out of it, hopefully, actually, I think, otherwise we would now tracking people living in uh, Namibia, probably, that's not a good thing. But, uh, uh, but, but I mean, the, the, the don't allow companies who do business like that, and I think we're pretty much up to it. That's a different discussion than Facebook and Google, eh? I realize that as well. But for us, and there are, well, I would say on mandate is, people who do business in the public space in Amsterdam, uh, actually, we do have discussions with uh, Google uh, Maps and, and Waze as well on traffic. So we. Uh, 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 work with them on not sharing uh, too much data and, and, and talk to them about these things as well. So we, we should take a stance about all these people companies doing business in a city, in a government, in, in, a, in a country or whatever, but for us in a city, uh, and we should come up with regulations where possible, based on digital rights. Thank you. Okay, one, one more question, yes. Yes, hi. Uh, about uh, scaling up, I wanted to take the, the example of two citizens. You've got a uh, citizen from Amsterdam, is going to move to Rotterdam or to Brussels in another country. How do you plan to to, to work on this? And also, uh, what about people living in a rural area? Is it also something that you're thinking about? Thank you. Yeah, we have three kilometers, square kilometers of rural area in, in municipality, so it's, it's not, not, not top of mind, I would say, for the last question. But um, for the first two things, I mean, in the end, uh, What's always happening when you move, basically, we uh, transfer your data partly as well from Bayer Pay to another city as well. So we transfer part of the data when you register in another city partly as well. So uh, but now we do it. In the end, what you want to do, like in healthcare, uh, we should do that as well. But you're responsible for taking your data over there, actually. And, and maybe we can facilitate it so you can put a switch so you don't need to go with your USB or whatever. I mean, I can understand that as well. But this is via my Amsterdam, actually, what we're actually now experimenting and what we... Uh, but cities around Amsterdam, so not uh, Rotterdam yet, but uh, because we can't imagine why you would move to Rotterdam in that perspective. But, uh, uh, but you, we can imagine you can't afford living in Amsterdam until you want to live close by. So some of the few cities around us, we try to work on that as well. People explicitly uh, uh, give the data to another municipality. So we try to work on porting your data as well in that perspective. But it's, it's, it's starting, so that's a lot of work to do. And there's national regulations making no sense. Super. Well, good of, uh, best of luck in your uh, oh, you. efforts, cool. uh, the different innovative uh, yeah, pilots and, and uh, efforts to make this great, uh, valuable city uh, happen. Thank, Thank you, you Ger. Thank you. So, if we could also get uh, the, the other slide deck yeah. available, and I'm going to take the, the <laughs> clicker. Then we go next to the awarding ceremony. And uh, now it's the time uh, to announce all of the 22 operator services uh, that have been putting loads and loads of effort, actually, uh, in the past three months um, to engage with MyData Global, but also uh, with, um, with each other to demonstrate how um, do they provide the different types of uh, tools uh, for individuals to, um, to empower with, uh, them with, uh, with their data um, and really descri uh, describe well how do they do it um, in practice. These uh, 22 uh, operator services um, provide uh, services uh, in more than 30 countries, but in, in general, actually globally, because the potential um, is, uh, is enormous and really doesn't have uh, or um, follow country, uh, country borders. Um, what I will uh, do um, is show um, a slide uh, with, uh, with all of the logos of the operator services. And as you can see, these uh, 22 um, have been awarded um, now with the MyData Operators 2021, and uh, uh, many of those operator services are joining us also online uh, today. So uh, all of the operator services uh, who are joining us today, if, you, if it's possible to also open your, your um, video, if it's not uh, open already, um, and uh, show uh, yourselves uh, that uh, uh, just give a um, 
wave or something that uh, you can indicate that you are uh, one of the operator services joining us uh, online. And congratulations to, to all of you. Hopefully, um, here. Well, um, we have also operator services uh, who have been uh, awarded uh, the word uh, joining us here today. And if I'm not mistaken, there should be a, at least six of uh, you uh, joining us here. And I would welcome you all on stage for a moment as well. Uh, so Marie Jose from from Schluss, uh, Paul Janssen from uh, Octo, Matthias from uh, Visions, um, Ian from Data Yogi, and and. Uh, yeah, y Yami or Ahari, you can also both uh, come on stage from, uh, from Vastu Group. Uh, could we give a big round of applause uh, also to, to the operator services here? <laughs> oh, and Katrina as well from Miko, please come as well. D did I miss anybody else? That a round of applause doesn't want to end. <laughs> Thank you all for putting this huge effort uh, in real world to make my data happen, give individuals uh, the right uh, to use their data and the ways how to do it um, actually, not only um, vision-wise. Uh, I would also welcome now here Teemu Roppon and the general manager of, of uh, My Data Global to congratulate you. Um, and we have prepared certificates with, um, for your, all of you. And I will help. So visions with Matthias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And Caro will also give you also um, a small pot of Estonian honey to give you strength uh, in your next um, efforts for this. Creative disruption. Yes. <laughs> Katrina from Miko, please give uh, also a round of applause. Vastu Group. <laughs> Marie Jose, which Luz. Thank you. Ian with information answers and data yogi. And, and Paul Janssen with Octo. All of the certificates will be also sent to uh, all of the operators uh, joining us online, so you won't uh, be uh, missing out with from these uh, certificates. We will send this uh, to you, and really glad that you could also join us uh, here today, even uh, online. Could we also get um, a microphone for a moment, if anyone of you would like to say, say a few words? Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's uh, uh, been a lot of words about uh, trust and being trustworthy and uh, for us as a yeah, more or less not, not new company but starting company uh, being trustworthy is, uh, is, is very important and the fact that uh, a trustworthy organization like MyData uh, endorses us that's what makes us credible so uh, we're thankful for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a very Finnish thing to say. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Thank you to my data for this work, for the trust, but also um, to, to give us the means to work together to this common uh, interoperability. And to organize, I've said it yesterday to Silva and to whoever wants to listen to me, that it's, uh, uh, that it's a great thing to have kept this event, that uh, all the people that could come have come, and that we can, uh, we can continue to tighten this community through a, through a human layer as well, because that's what we're all about. So thank you, my data, for all of this, and for the honey, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but I encourage everyone to remember those faces. Um, pick their sleeves later during the, the evening, and hopefully also many of you are, are joining us tomorrow to still hear more about your services. What kind of use cases do you have um, and, and really learn and engage with, uh, with you, as well as the online uh, operators joining us there. 
Um, so, round of applause when we send our operators back to their seats, and then I would uh, um, continue with uh, the next steps. Thank you again for everyone. <laughs> Thank you all. What I would do next is also to introduce uh, some people who have been behind the operator thematic group uh, and have been also engaging with, uh, with the service providers, analyzing them and uh, really supporting those operator services to yeah, be ahead of a curve when the new legislative developments are coming up. Really make sure that uh, they have also support from the community like MyData to, uh, to succeed. So um, please give also... Okay, let's try. Okay, yes. Please give also a round of applause uh, to Antti Jogi Poikola, uh, Kai Kuikaniemi, Kuhn de Jong, and Josh Langford. <laughs> Unfortunately, Kai and uh, Josh are not um, available to join us here today in Amsterdam, uh, but Jogi and Kuhn are here, so please come on stage as well. Thank you, Yoki. <laughs> also okay. for you, uh, for, for all of the work that you've been doing for the My Dead, uh, My Dead Operators uh, landscape and, and uh, also Kuhn for, okay. for you. Should we give it back to you because you have been actually supporting this proposal <laughs> better, so don't underestimate yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Silla, as well. Thank you. And thanks for all the applicants. That's, that's really, uh, I mean, it's so huge work what the applicants have put here. Oh, you have the uh, yeah. microphone, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, that was actually my, uh, my thought, that uh, would you like to also say something uh, for, for the operators um, joining us online or, or here today? Um, I have my presentation yes. coming. Yogi. Maybe you want to come. Yeah, I've it's on, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, I again really enjoyed reading all the applications and learning so much about the many differences, although we, I think we are all trying to achieve the same goal. Um, it's really interesting to see how people do this in different ways and especially also during uh, the peer review calls where people are so interested in learning each other's offerings and using uh, the knowledge of others to well improve each other basically. So that's a great uh, process to support, so thank you. Thank you. So now we are, as Yogi mentioned, uh, going to hear some further insights from the overall over operator landscape, what we've learned uh, from analyzing these uh, um, operator previously applicants and now our ODs. Um, so Yogi, please. Okay. Do I have the clicker? Yes. Okay. So. Operator landscape. My name is Antti Yogi Poikola. It was said already. Uh, I've been in this uh, panel reviewing all the applications, but I'm also uh, currently chair of uh, My Data Global, the board chair. So I'm involved in many other My Data activities as well, and it's super to be here. <laughs> so, okay, these are not newest version, I guess, or is it now? Uh, somebody needs to refresh the slides. Mm -hmm. So I did my slides on the last moment. <laughs> <laughs> no surprises there. That's the opening and closing uh, session, though. No? I sent you the data monetization uh, deck. Ah, OK. So but uh, can you, uh, find them this is not share? the Google slide deck? Okay, meanwhile, uh, we are looking for the slide deck. I have a task for everyone of you. Uh, so you saw here the operators, and many of them are online as well. So you probably have some questions in your mind regarding what are these organizations? Where do they come from? Uh, what do they do? So think for a moment. You can write it down because I, I'm going to leave uh, time for Q&A. That's probably most interesting here. 
So really, don't hesitate. There are many questions, and this is really here now to clarify what are my data operators, because that's not a simple uh, question. And I've got many questions around the world where I go and speak about my data operators. So now it's also your time to ask. You saw faces and you saw logos, but you might not know much more about that. So what do you want to know about the operators? What do we know about these awarded operators? So I give some statistics, but uh, uh, your questions are the most important. So uh, we have 22 operators. Uh, they are present, uh, legally present. Uh, as Silla told, they offer services uh, really widely, but uh, they have legal presence in 13 countries. So it could be said that it's still very European phenomenon but not uniquely European. So, and again, uh, this representation of operators, what we have here, it's not like there could not be any other operators in the world, but this is also uh, who we reached and who have been in the community. Most of these have been actually active over the, not just applying for, for the award, but being included and uh, actively contributing to the discussions already for a longer time. So many of them are from Europe. Uh, you see the countries there. There are some from Japan, uh, one from US, and one from Australia this year. Uh, other statistic is that uh, these are uh, still small enterprises. So uh, this uh, personal working for the operator activities means that personal working for the operator activities. So for example, we have big companies like NTT and Fujitsu. So they are more than 50 people, I would say. But uh, the uh, group that is actually working for the op operator activities, these are still rather small. So uh, mostly uh, like uh, up to 10 people. Some are bigger, up to 50 people, but no like big, big uh, enterprises in this group yet. You can contemplate and think about this. What do you want to ask from me? Take your questions. So uh, where do they m uh, make money? What are the sources of revenue? We didn't ask, ask in detail uh, of uh, everything, but uh, you saw the picture that basically my data operators are the intermediaries. They're facilitating the data flows according to human-centric principles between people and organizations data sources and data users, so they could charge for the uh, data using service that the service pays, or they could charge for the data sources that the data sources pay, or they could charge the individuals so that I pay for these services, or uh, there could be somebody else who just wants to see this kind of data sharing happening in the world and subsidize this uh, infrastructure, even if they are not one of these parties. Like we heard, uh, maybe city of Amsterdam wishes to subsidize this one day. City of Helsinki is actually already doing that. So there could be uh, other uh, organizations that are not directly involved in the data exchange, but they want it to happen. And then there are some like uh, other category, which is many things. Uh, so it, it can be uh, seen that uh, subsidizing customers, so somebody who sees the need for this kind of uh, data sharing infrastructure to be there but is not directly participating in the exchanges, that's the most typical uh, source of revenue for today's my data operators. Uh, then we saw the uh, image of uh, these nine functional elements that uh, operators may implement or not. So it's not required that to be my data operator, you have to tick box on all of the nine. Uh, uh, how do, did we actually assess this? We asked uh, each and every operator to uh, rate from uh, one to five, how important is uh, this particle, or zero to five, I guess. How important is this particular area? So is identity management super important or a little bit important or, or for all of those? And uh, here we see that uh, 
they are quite, uh, I think, personal data transfer uh, identity are the most, but it's, it's getting up there that many of the operators are building uh, capabilities for these different areas. Maybe value exchange and service management are a little bit lagging behind or not, not in the portfolio of uh, all of the operators, but compared to last year, this is leveling up. So more of the operators are doing more of the areas. Uh, and then I'm, uh, we had this one section of the uh, survey this year was uh, very particular for Europe because there is new legislation called uh, Data Governance Act coming up. So it, it should be finalized uh, by, uh, by the end of this year and then put into an, uh, enforced uh, early next year, uh, which actually uh, creates uh, this, uh, it talks about data intermediary. It's not only for personal data, uh, uh, but quite importantly for personal data intermediaries. And it sets certain requirements that if you are this kind of trusted intermediaries, you are, you need to do this and that. So it's, it's a big thing that there, I, I think it's uh, the first uh, like hard regulation of this type. Well, there are some similarities in some other countries. Uh, and then there are some soft regulation like uh, the Japanese uh, information bank scheme, for example. So this is coming up and we asked from, from those of the operators who uh, are looking forward to have business in Europe and would fall under this uh, regulation on how would they uh, fill the uh, envisioned requirements. And we did this uh, to, to assess uh, First of all, to kind of understand if there are some requirements that are super hard uh, to, to put in place or bad in some other ways so that we could still pass the message because it's not finalized. But the outcome was that, no, it's, it's like, okay, the uh, requirements, uh, but they are really hard to understand. That's, the, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what came out, that uh, reading the law and thinking whether we actually will or how, do we, how are we going to uh, com comply with this, it's a hard thing. And I think this uh, is, of course, there is operators outside of Europe. Not everybody is going to do business in Europe, but also for those who are not, it's probably uh, wise to follow the more or less same requirements. And I think this is also the community to collectively understand what they mean and what should be the response for it. We are not going to, to uh, publish the individual answers to the Data Governance uh, Act questions because it's so new, but we are doing a kind of collective analysis of, of the results and they are coming soon. So those are the uh, things that uh, I could very quickly over a couple of days to just extract on, on uh, like aggregate level from the um, uh, applications. I have lots of... Uh, thoughts on individual applications, but I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be unfair and pick some favors, favorite <laughs> operators or anything like that. Uh, but uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, things are moving. Uh, this is not, we didn't get more operators this year, actually few less than uh, to, uh, last year. Uh, but the quality of uh, applications, uh, I think it went, went generally up and uh, many of the operators are moving and, and uh, I saw this kind of uh, understanding of the common language is becoming better. Some even just said that uh, they did, decided to sort of ditch their own vocabulary and, and adopt the My Data way of describing things because they thought that, okay, we used to use this word, but now we could equally use this other word. And kind of this kind of harmonization from bottom up starts to happen. But now going back to your questions. So uh, what do we know and what do we want to know about the operators? I think we have a couple of minutes. Uh, so I wish to get many good and hard questions. Who is the first one? Can be also from online audience. Who is reading out if somebody chats there? OK. Questions? Come on, you want to know something? Okto, uh, I have one question about uh, the group other kind of revenues. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that one? 
Uh, it was varied. Um, there was, for example, something that we couldn't actually consider revenue if it's, for example, grant from public uh, um, source. So it's kind of investment to build it, and that kind of uh, revenue sources. Uh, I think that was the most common in the other category to, to be noted that uh, there is some sort of development grant. OK, thanks. Uh, maybe then a question to any of the operators that wants to answer. Uh, many of the operators were still uh, uh, micro enterprises or, or, or small enterprises. Uh, so a question would be to any operator, how big do you think you have to be to become sustainable? I can try to answer for, for Octo then. <laughs> I think we need uh, 50 people. 50 people. So we are about 40 at the moment. And I think we need another year to grow to a kind of maximum. And then I think the, the platform is fully uh, sustainable. And, uh, and then we can you know, invest in, in new stuff, but also keep the old stuff working. So I think we need about 50. Yeah. There was a question from online. Thanks. Yeah, two questions online. Uh, the first is, have any of the operators published their revenue figures? And the second question was, have there been any difficulties um, in working with other operators? Uh, first question, uh, I don't think that the operator organizations are any different from any other companies. Uh, we didn't ask for the revenue figures, and I think uh, uh, companies do publish if they are public companies and if they are privately owned they might not publish so I, I think there is no particular difference between operators and other companies so we didn't look for the revenue figures and what was the other question the other question was that were there any challenges in working with operators you mean from my data global with the operators or operators with I think within the operator group uh, so yeah. it's a really a question for operators, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's probably a question for the operators, but like being observing it from the operator group. Uh, I think the big challenge is really still on coming into the terms of the common understanding and common language. What we did this year uh, was that we have this reference model, uh, the nine areas. So uh, we had... Uh, workshops from each one of these areas and uh, we had really good participation many of these awarded operators were involved to kind of banging heads together and trying to understand what it actually means when we speak about uh, let's say service uh, management or identity management and these discussions were very uh, intense in a way hard and that's also something that I want to thank all the operators to, to kind of having the persistence to try to understand each other. <laughs> so, so that's the big challenge and, and uh, something uh, I can publicly announce is that uh, the outcomes of that work, we are going to uh, do republish the white paper just uh, with the new, area, new uh, reference model, so more details on those and of course uh, then in the 2020 published paper, there was only this uh, proto-operator, somebody that we thought that might be my data operator. So uh, we will, of course, replace that with the actual operators. So that will be coming up uh, by, by uh, early next year. So that's, I think, the biggest challenge in, in collaboration is really the language at this stage. Yeah. Uh, the mic is here, just a second. Okay. Do you have any idea about the verticals that are involved in uh, operators, the different industries? Yeah. So we did ask uh, like TikTok's question on, on which of the verticals, whether you are in business of uh, health or finance or so forth. Unfortunately, <laughs> my spreadsheet capabilities ran out, plus time ran out, so I couldn't get this figure. It was just because there was uh, lots of uh, data and I, I didn't figure out how to do it. Uh, I didn't have time to do it manually and, and my automation skills felt short, so it's not here. But we asked, uh, asked it and 
Generally, uh, well, there are some big areas. I, I can easily say that finance is big one, health is big one, cities is becoming big one. Uh, I think those are, but uh, these have been already for a long time. And then there are some uh, up runners, but uh, I, I will do the analysis and show the figures later on. Yeah, uh, uh, still on the question about uh, interoperability and working together, um, it's, it's about uh, understanding each other's language, of course, but uh, carefully we are also, also uh, cooperating with other initiatives here in the Netherlands to see if we can uh, work towards uh, technically uh, making uh, interoperability work as well. Because I think as, uh, as operators we need to cooperate in uh, in, 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 at this moment to make the, the whole system work. So it's starting to, to, to cooperate very carefully, very small, but cooperation is starting. I see some eye blinking from Silla, so what's the time? <laughs> we should start uh, wrapping uh, up this section. Um, as we had still the possibility to uh, talk with uh, three operator services and potentially even ask those uh, uh, some questions uh, then directly from, from the operator services. So thank you, Yogi, for, for this. And um, yeah, all of those insights. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the operators meet regularly in, uh, in my uh, global Slack as well as uh, in online uh, workshops. So if you'd like to le learn more, definitely do join um, operator Slack channel and, and yeah, d discuss further. But um, let's take a the clicker. There we go. So the last, but uh, definitely not least, uh, section of this awarding session is the fireside chats with three operator services. And we picked them because they are uh, from three different continents. So Fujitsu Limited with uh, Personium service uh, uh, joining us uh, online from Japan, Dixon. And then Katrina Miko uh, here on site today, um, and Sterling from Self Innovations from the US joining again uh, online. But uh, to talk with them, we've asked uh, Peter Olson uh, to, to join us, who is an investigative journalist here in Netherlands. And um, please welcome on stage Peter, uh, that will, who will then also introduce all of the operator services more uh, in depth. So please. And uh, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all today uh, for having me here. It's, it's a very inspiring community. Maybe even the most inspiring community uh, I've, I've been in, and not, not private, of course, but uh, for business. And many interesting talks, and people uh, have many ideas here. Uh, we ran out of time, and that's, uh, that means that this whole bunch and list of questions I'm not going through. I think uh, what I heard people are very interested in the last subject is how to reach a market, how to become mature. And uh, I tried to elaborate with three parties here on that main subject. How do they think they will reach a market? and uh, become mature and how they th what they think about partnering uh, for example dixon it's you can we hear you as well i see you now yes. can you yeah? yeah okay you're in japan now with the personium uh, what i read is that it's the first and still the only open source personal data store platform in japan and created by Fujitsu, uh, and it's developed uh, for both common users and enterprises. Um, and of course, uh, Fujitsu we know already uh, for many years as one of the main, may I say, IT companies. Uh, can we? Yes, there, there is back. Uh, can, can you tell me about him? Is, is it easier for you than for him? We, we talk here about uh, very, uh, or not very, but rather small companies. Is it easier for you with a, with a huge company behind you to, uh, to reach a market? And 
how do you um, interact with for you too? How important is it for you? Can you elaborate on that, please? Um, yes, um, it's kind of a both yes and no because um, with the teacher, then uh, um, they, they kind of like pay my salary so that I can drive the Australian community, and then also um, they pay my salary to uh, participate um, in this um, migrant community. But again, um, it's so huge that um, every business unit is just competing with each other. So. Uh, even though um, we are kind of like getting friendly uh, association of collaboration from um, minor operators opera in, 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 in the world, but then we feel to do so. We, we, we are not welcome sometimes because uh, they have their own other products. So each other, we just get things at our phone. So uh, it, it's very hard to persuade the other company and the other to, to drop their, their solutions and then just use the sun. And the good, only good thing is like we are open source, so uh, we don't have to have this binding problem. So uh, I would say uh, we work out good with uh, the digital and uh, the product connections and everything. And the trustworthy is also because um, it's so huge that um, um, I would say most people would trust using the digital product. That's all. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your clear answer. Um, the next question is, uh, how many people are using your service and which organizations do you connect? Yeah, it's hard to say because back, back in the um, 2011, um, when we have the big traffic, we already have the, uh, the service um, to provide for the refugees to take care of their um, pets, but then uh, it's usually just short-term services and then some POCs for companies that they want to explore the idea of um, the, uh, of, of the, idea of, the idea of sharing personal data. So uh, I would say mostly, at the most, we have uh, sometimes 500 users and then sometimes it's 500 different clinics that connect together to share the data for the, for the uh, apps or, or patients. And uh, currently, it's kind of brought down to just POCs uh, with some uh, municipality or some organization that um, we are not allowed to see. And then some, uh, one, one, also we have a, a big contract with the uh, Japanese data bank platform and uh, we are providing the platform to them so that they can resell it as a uh, sandbox or something. And, and, and that's kind of confidential, so I'm not allowed to say so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's nice to hear. Uh, Dixon, Dixon uh, thank you very, very much for your uh, contribution here. And uh, we enjoy. Uh, shouldn't you be asleep right now or go to bed? Yes, it's <laughs> I, I kind of like this week is my Amsterdam time zone, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so thank you even more for your contribution. Thank you very much and have a successful. Uh, Next one is not a sleepy. Katrina, can you please uh, uh, come over and answer some questions? We know Amico as, uh, as one of the most important players in the world uh, in this field, already uh, uh, developing since uh, 2012, first in the fintech sector in uh, Australia, then coming to Europe, to Brussels, I guess. Yes. No? Okay. Y yeah, um, so we, we don't have, uh, we don't need too much uh, introduction. I, I heard you say this morning already, uh, very important. Sorry. I'm too big, sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, stand on this table. <laughs> okay, uh, I heard you talking about the market. Huh? You, you, you want to reach the market, you are reaching the market already with a bank also, a big, the biggest Be Belgian bank, uh, KBC, as far as I know. Uh, can you tell me uh, how do you develop a market and a business model together with this bank? Uh, okay. Oh, I think no, no, no. I'm using this. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was mic'd up, but did I do something? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also reading the mind. Thank you. Um, so I think a few things. Um, 
Uh, I think there is reaching the market and there's also market making. And I think, I think one of the things for, for many people in the room, and also if we go right back to the beginning or the roots of the My Data white paper, um, it was an idea, it was a vision. Uh, and if you look at how many markets emerged or were created, you know, they started with a concept or, or an idea. And when we first read that paper in translated into English, I think it was within weeks that I was over in Helsinki thinking, okay, someone else is seeing this, yeah? And then I think so part of it is that cooperative process of how you engage, which is part of market making. Another part of market making is this product market fit. And, and for me, I had come from financial services background, so it was natural to understand many of the opportunities um, in that sector. And, and as you said, KBC is not only the biggest bank in Belgium, but it is just recently won again, the most trusted brand in, in Belgium, not bank, but also the best app in the world, the best banking app in the world. So it's a big privilege for us to be part of that infrastructure. Um, but like any move to a new market, it, it is always starts with the customer. Customer wakes up in the morning, you and I, there's a job that we need to do, there is someone we need to trust, there is something that needs to happen as an outcome and who is there to help. And that, that's our, our whole philosophy is start with the, with the individual and then what is the mutual value that can be created through that process. And I think for KBC, um, they've just been at the forefront of recognising this idea of um, providing that service to customers is a big part of reinforcing that trust. Mm -hmm. Where do you think you will stand in, uh, let's say, three, four years from now? Uh, three or four years, I think um, what, we, what we did differently in this last 18 months that COVID forced um, was that we realised that we couldn't be necessarily in the room with people working things out and working on use cases. So we turned our attention to modularising our tech stack, uh, creating a developer portal, and then understanding that there were probably three groups. Um, there were large enterprises, uh, there were SMEs that maybe were trying to look at how they could incorporate something in an existing capability, and then there were startups that wanted to build and have that framework right out of the box. And so I think where what we can already see um, based on this last year is those different sectors growing. Uh, and, and also what I see is things like open banking, um, data regulation, for instance, in Australia, the consumer data right, starting to accelerate different sectors often starting in financial services, moving to telecommunications and utilities. Um, so I, I see in the next few years, some of these industry sectors aligning to create more ecosystems. And I think that's gonna be the big shift into these mutual ecosystems, and which could include startups using the same underlying technology as a large enterprise. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this biggest bank of Belgium um, and most trusted bank has a lot of big, huge databases with customer data. Uh, I don't think they want to get rid of their customer data. How do you, how do you look upon that? So, so first of all, we, um, I think the strategy for any organisation, and it's certainly not my place to, to speak on behalf of the bank or in fact any of our customers, I think our philosophy is and, not or. Mm -hmm. um, so, our guiding mission is to enable everyone in the planet to get equity and value for the data they exchange. Um, and that means you and I, but it also may mean a service provider, an organisation. So there is contextual reasons or there is regulatory reasons, particularly for a bank, that requires them to hold data to be able to uh, perform the duties that they perform and that they're regulated. The difference is this and, saying there is also the opportunity for customers to have a safe space. The bank doesn't have access to the data. We don't have access to the data. It's something that only the customer um, uh, has full control of, which then takes you into this collaboration. Again, it's the and, okay? The bank may have a lot of information uh, using the systems that are legitimately collecting that data, but what does that look like when you put it together with data that may have come 
if it's either volunteered or verified from other sources, what's the power of that collaboration? And I, and I think that's the big shift. It's not one for the other, it's this magic of the and. Okay, that's very, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Katrina, thank you. and uh, for uh, uh, coming here and arriving here. We're now moving to the United States. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I would say your votes, please, but uh, we, we, we are first turning to the two states. Uh, once someone got up fairly early, I guess. No? No, no problem. It's a uh, good time for me. Yeah. I should ask, are you woke? But that's not a good question. <laughs> Maybe. I'm sorry. Uh, we will talking with, uh, and I hope I, I, I pronounce your, your name uh, good, your CEO of uh, Self Innovations. Um, Signet, Signet, is, it, is that your first name, Signet Sterling? He's embarrassed, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's my, my mistake, yeah? Hello, your microphone. Or talk with your hands. There we go. I yeah, have thank you very much. You. Yeah, so my name is uh, R. Sterling Sneed. Yes, my first name is just letter R. And it is very confusing for people. Okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for getting up so early. And, uh, no problem. Happy to be yeah. here. Uh, your company uh, is, uh, has become a member of uh, my data. Why? Why is it so important for you, for an American company, to be a member of this worldwide organization? I think it's helpful for me because my data is trying to set international standardizations, terminology of interoperability, and um, it is difficult explaining to people in the United States what my in multiple countries, um, the United States, Europe, Africa, and so explaining that we are of the highest standards according to a European organization for GDPR, DGA, but also human centricity and ethics uh, helps give a better reputation, but also a major part of it for me was just education. Learning from all of the members of my data uh, has been extremely helpful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are now, um, your current project is self-pass um, and it is used in the COVID crisis. Uh, how many people are using it and how are they using it? So I can't say the numbers exactly because we have actually used the back-end framework in other applications as well for uh, human protection in dangerous areas and that's under NDA. But um, w the most interesting application has been in um, Africa or other areas because uh, vaccine passports uh, don't work in countries where they can't have access to vaccinations. Um, so what happened is, is we were developing um, basically a comprehensive personal health record. Then the pandemic hit and we said we needed to build the um, a multivariable health passport. So we set up a scientific research institute, uh, worked with an epidemiology clinic out of Hungary, and said, okay, how can we build medical logic and then translate that into a usable health passport app that's adaptable and flexible in multiple countries? And the countries where they didn't have access to the vaccines were obviously most interested uh, at first. And explaining in the United States, I mean, I think everyone gets news about what's going on in the United States. It's a lot of fractionization mess here. Oh, yeah? And, and <laughs> what a nice country. Uh, talking about this uh, n nice country and big tech, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, uh, where do you think uh, consumers and companies are heading in ter terms of uh, using personal data? And will big tech uh, enter this arena? That's a good question. Honestly, I think the big tech has already entered this arena. It's us that's new. Um, they entered into, they were using personal data ages ago. Um, I mean, even 
back in 2019, um, there's a famous quote from Sean Parker, the first you know um, president of Facebook, that said, "Privacy is the new celebrity, but privacy is not necessarily data access or data transparency." Um, one of my friends uh, was the co-chairman for Deloitte Center for the Edge for a long time, and he wrote a book back in 1999 called Net Worth that talked about infomediaries. So I think big tech has known that this is coming for a long time, but uh, especially organizations like mine and, and, and all the other operators that are coming and saying we want to our uh, to use it to empower individuals to better our own lives is really the new entry into the arena. Mm -hmm. Can Facebook save itself by bec um, giving data to, uh, to the users? And get rid of this oh, big that's a good databases. Question. I don't know if I can speak on behalf of Facebook, um, but oh, no? I have a lot of connections into Silicon Valley. I've invested in tech. I mean, in 2017, there was a company that to, to us, uh, one of my investing firm, uh, uh, they could basically scrape public social media and predict your credit score within 20 points. Is that this data can be used for lots of different things. I think Facebook has the problem that they built just so quickly. They weren't trying to build something bad in the beginning. They were just trying to build and innovate quickly. And we tried to learn from that mistake, which is why we set up two entities. We set up a benefit corporation that's getting a B Corp status. Um, because in the United States, a lot of people won't take you seriously if you're a nonprofit. But we also set up a nonprofit for scientific research for, for human data. And basically that publishes the data to the public and then the benefit corporation builds the innovations because you have to have informed development land in trouble. Do you know that's uh, the last question that already uh, about 12 years ago uh, within Google, a personal data market uh, was developed as an auction where, where uh, data was given to the users, to the people, and they could auction their data with uh, digital companies. Uh, what do you think about uh, monetization and uh, auction model for personal data? Um. I think as long as there's the there's the responsibility of the person or entity or organization to educate the users on what they're doing with it. There was a really great experiment at Berkeley University where a coffee shop was set up and students could uh, basically sell their data for a cup of coffee or a bagel, but they don't they didn't know where the data went or what happened to it or what it was used for. So, you know, you think about use cases, what happens if you have an elderly person who's not very tech savvy or a person who has special needs with limited capacity? It's, a, it's upon the operator, the owner of the organization to have some form of, of, of and for the people about what selling their data really means. Technology is a tool, like the difference between a handsaw or a chainsaw uh, you can do a lot of self-damage with a chainsaw, so you have to make sure that people have proper training and there's proper guards in place. Mm -hmm. Maya, thank you very, very much for your contribution here. It was very useful. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. And I think this is nearly uh, the end. They asked me to sing, which I will do now for one and a half hour. <laughs> the door will be closed. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, for, uh, Peter, for, uh, for chatting with operators, some Finnish chocolate uh, oh, also for you too, chocolate. for the Christmas part uh, or Christmas that is uh, um, coming up um, soon. Hopefully this was also interesting uh, to, Thank to you. you. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. <laughs> and this is it uh, for the awarding session of Mighted Operators 2021. Um, last slides to show uh, before we move uh, hopefully to some um, social programs, some uh, more chats with each other. Um, as was mentioned already before by Yogi, um, also we um, publish uh, the applications of, uh, of uh, operator services. And um, if you'd like to learn more about certain questions that we've asked, 
how do they really provide the services uh, for these different functional elements, then um, you will have the chance um, for, for it through the application flow, uh, for uh, platform actually through this um, link. Don't need to remember right away, this will also be added um, to our website. So uh, my data operators uh, from the my data website will be um, your key uh, resource for that. But um, before uh, we close, some final resources uh, to leave with, uh, with you. Um, the My Data Declaration is the key cornerstone for the whole community and also the, um, the operators uh, to yeah, uh, describe how do they really try to uh, bring the declaration to, to life. Um, the My Data or, um, Operators website, the different uh, papers that we published, but also the white paper on um, uh, My Data Operators, the Slack, and uh, also our the, the way, uh, the forum for joining us uh, uh, as a member, either as an individual or organization. And if this has been interesting uh, to you, um, and actually you might uh, actually provide uh, operator services your own, then there will be a new application, application round coming up next year, starting from January. Um, we will share the news also um, already later uh, this year, how and where you can apply. So uh, there will be more awards uh, given out and hopefully many more operators, uh, operator services joining us uh, in this community. So congratulations again to all of the awardees of 2021 uh, joining us online or here in Amsterdam. And I think this is it uh, for, for today. Let's give a final round of applause.